because this is the first live stream that I've done in a while. Um, I think it actually has been a few months. I, I just haven't gotten around to doing one, so I'm very excited to jump back in and do this. I have a new setup new backdrop this is going to be in the videos from now on instead of the purple screen and i'm very very thankful for that this is a very cushy chair uh, i have my blanket i am all comfortable here so i encourage you wherever you are if you can get comfortable get comfortable um grab your bible if you want to i will be reading everything out loud but if you want to follow along in your bible i encourage you to do so we're going to be mainly in the book of romans today uh, we probably will jump around a little bit and do some reference verses here in different chapters, but mainly in the book of Romans. And we're going to be in Romans chapter 5. Uh, the book of Romans, I feel bad picking favorite books of the Bible because, I mean, you know, they're all great. But Romans is still one of my favorite books of the Bible. I think it's just a very encouraging book overall. Um, especially when you get into Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 28 and then verses 38 through 39 that just really remind us of how much God loves us, of how much he wants what's best for us, that he's working all things out for good for us, even behind the scenes when we can't see it, and that nothing on, in heaven, nothing on earth, nothing anywhere at all can separate us from his love which is in christ jesus our lord and that's just an incredible beautiful wonderful truth so let's go ahead we're going to read all of romans chapter 5 and then i'm going to go section by section and kind of give little commentaries about each section so i'm going to read first of all though romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 21 if you want to join me in your word and i'm going to be starting in verse 1. therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only that but we also rejoice in god through our lord jesus christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed where there is no law Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, 
so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Last verse. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. That was kind of a lot. Uh, that was 21 verses worth. So let's break that down. I don't know how this chapter appears in your Bible, but mine is in little bite-sized sections. Let's see, there are one, two, three. It looks like three of those sections in this chapter for me. And we're gonna take it by those particular sections and kind of explain what each one is talking about and give a little bit of encouragement as we go along because the book of Romans is such an encouraging book to me. And this chapter is especially geared at people who have already been saved, believers in Christ. We are looking at justification, sanctification, and glorification. Bye, Shana. Have a good day. Also, if you guys are just popping on, I'm so glad you're here. Um, we are doing a study on the book of Romans, and we are in Romans chapter 5, taking it <clears throat> section by section. So if you join me for past live streams, or maybe even watch some videos on the YouTube channel or listen to the podcast, then you've probably heard me talking about three different steps, parts, of salvation. Like I said, those are justification, sanctification, and glorification. And it's really important to understand the difference between those. Because when we start to mix those up and when we blend them together, there can be some confusion when we're reading through the Bible in different passages. So let's talk about those for a minute before we jump into this first uh, section of verses. So Justification is that salvation from sin's penalty. That is what happens the moment that you trust in Jesus for salvation. You are rescued from an eternity spent in hell away from God. You are clothed in the very righteousness of Christ. You are justified. You are made clean in the sight of the Lord. And once you have been saved, once you have been justified before God in Christ, nothing can take that away from you. Remember Romans 8, 38 through 39, as I was saying just a few moments earlier, talks about how nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, nothing in hell, no one and nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And John 10 verses 28 through 30, that is another great assurance that once we are within the hand of God, once we have trusted in Jesus for salvation, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by him, we are part of the family of God forever. We are adopted. We are made co-heirs with Christ, and that is such a glorious promise. That is justification. When we typically talk about salvation, when you say, this is my testimony, this is when I was saved, you're talking about justification. Now, sanctification is a little bit different. Sanctification is that Christian walk. It is living the new regenerated life, walking in the ways of the new man and leaving the ways of the old man behind. It's walking in the spirit and not giving way to the flesh. And even though we have been justified when you have believed in the testimony of Jesus unto salvation, you can still sin. That sin nature still lives within us. It is a constant, everyday, sometimes moment by moment battle to do what we know is correct, to lean into the spirit, to walk in the way of the Lord to say, God, I submit to your will. Sanctification is growing in the faith. If justification is being born and entering into uh, the world as a baby, then sanctification is growing up and learning to walk. It's like being a toddler and taking those steps and maturing and getting older and older and reading your Bible and praying and learning what it's like to be mature in the Lord. And then there's glorification. Glorification 
is separation from sin's presence entirely. We can't have that while we're here on earth. We still live in a very fallen world and we are very fallen people, even if we have been saved, even if we have believed in Jesus for salvation. But glorification is promised one day in heaven for all who believe. One day we will be separated from ever from the presence of sin and simply able to glory in the Lord to worship him and to honor him forevermore and that will be a wonderful glorious day so those are three stages of salvation uh, justification sanctification and glorification and this chapter in romans mentions every single one of them so i'll tell you when we have reached those and we'll talk through them let's go ahead though and look at the first section in romans chapter 5 and that will go from verses 1 through verse 5. just out of curiosity what if a person decides to leave the faith I believe that person still had faith prior to their apostasy, but lots of Calvinists would argue otherwise. That is an excellent question. And that is something that's brought up quite frequently when you're looking at the difference between Calvinism, Arminianism, and where I fall, which is free grace theology. So I would believe, as you know, you are believing here, that if someone believed in Jesus initially, believed the right thing, the right content of faith, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he rose again and is the only way to heaven, if they truly believe that, then they have been saved. Um, that's all you have to do. Works should be something that show the health of our faith. Again, the difference between justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is believing that right content of faith. Sanctification is doing good works for the Lord's honor and glory to show others what it means to be a follower of Christ. And then, of course, we talked about glorification. And it's hard to know people's hearts. I mean, that's the thing. Only God knows what people believe. So I, I couldn't say for sure if somebody was in the church and then left the church, what exactly it was that they believed. But I personally believe if you are exercising that right content of faith that like we said, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he rose again and is the only way to heaven, that you are saved. Uh, John 10, 28 through 30, that we referenced just a few minutes ago, talks about how no one can take you out of the Father's hand. Uh, we're not powerful enough to save ourselves, and I would argue that we're not powerful enough to take away our salvation either. Um, there's a verse in Scripture as well, I can't remember the reference this minute, but it says, even if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So um, it's very possible to be a carnal Christian. It's very possible to not be healthy in your walk with the Lord, to be saying and doing and believing things that you shouldn't be. Um, but to have been saved at one point in time. We get into the difference between um, entering into heaven with nothing to show for it, just, you know, scraping by simply there by the grace of the Lord, as we all are, versus having rewards, um, having crowns to present back to Jesus. There, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians here, uh, that we read about our foundation uh, you can only have one foundation, and that is Jesus Christ, but we all have the opportunity to build upon that foundation of faith, and you can build upon it with good things, or you can build upon it with bad things, and if you build upon it with bad things, those bad things will be burned up before the Lord, but you will still enter heaven because you've believed in Jesus. You just won't have anything to present back to him, any sort of um, you know, eternal rewards. But if you have built good things upon that foundation, then you will have something to present to him. So I hope that makes sense. That was um, kind of a roundabout way of answering it, but hopefully that answered what you were asking. That was a great question.
Oh, hey, I'm so glad that you're here. I completely understand. Right before this, my Wi-Fi was glitching. I am hoping and praying that it holds on through this. So if I ever slightly disappear during this live stream, I'm still here. I'm trying to get back. Absolutely. We have the example of the prodigal son. God is always calling us to come back home. Um, it's never too late. His arms are always open wide. And that is such a precious truth that he loves us in spite of ourselves. We don't have any redeeming qualities, honestly, but he still loves us. And I'm grateful for that mercy and love every day. Okay, awesome. I'm so, so glad I did. Thank you for asking that. Anyone else, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to drop them. Um, I like when we can communicate during these Bible studies, and it's not just me talking, because as I'm a natural introvert, introvert, someone who has anxiety anyway, I am very grateful to have comments and interaction. So let's look at Romans 5 verses 1 through 5, break that down. So Romans 5 verses 1 through 5, let's read those again. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word peace, I looked that up in the Greek and it means peace of mind, uh, tranquility arising from reconciliation with God, a sense of divine favor. There is no peace like the Lord gives. It's the peace that passes all understanding, we are told. It's the ability, even in the hard times of life, to say it's going to be okay. Because Jesus has promised us that in this world we will have trouble. It's not a question of if we will have trouble, but when we will have trouble. But he has said, I have overcome the world. So many people have this wrong idea that the Christian life is going to be easy. That once they are saved, once they've been justified, once they have believed that right content of faith in Jesus Christ, that everything goes smoothly. But that's a very wrong thought. If someone tells you that, if someone says that uh, when you are a Christian, you're going to have lots of money, um, lots of prosperity, only happy times, good things. They, they just don't know what they're talking about because the Bible shows us case after case of people who were genuinely followers of the Lord. They were men of great faith, and yet their worlds came crashing down around them. Um, I'm thinking right now of, of Job. I've been studying in that book recently. And Job, the Bible goes to great pains to tell us that he was a righteous man. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. God even is recorded as commending him, praising him for the things that he did, saying, hey, that's a great job. And yet, for no fault of his own, Job experienced so much loss, so much pain. He lost his children. He lost all of his farm animals, everything all in one day. And he even lost his own health. He went through a very painful condition with boils all over his body. And the people that were closest to him in his life, his friends, his wife, they weren't any sort of encouragement to him. He was utterly alone except for his faith in God. We have Paul. Paul talks about a thorn in his flesh, not a literal thorn poking in there, but something in his life that was incredibly troublesome, burdensome to him. And he says that he asks God three times for this to be taken from him. And God says to him, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Essentially, no, I'm not going to take it away, but that is for your good and for my glory to learn to rest in me, to grow in me. And also we have Elijah. Elijah, who had just socked it to the false prophets of Baal and shown the majesty of the Lord up on the mountain. He comes down into this very low place in his life 
And he even asks the Lord to simply take his life. He is so upset, so stressed out. And God is there to comfort him in that. The point is, these were all men of strong faith. They were all what we would say good people. And yet they had hard times. Being a Christian does not exempt you from hard times. But again, it helps us to find purpose in our pain, to realize that suffering is never for nothing. There is a testimony in our test. There is a a purpose in that pain, and there is a peace that is greater than it all. When we cling to the cross, we realize that God is indeed working all things out for our good. Even in the dark times, He is the light. And really, that's what this whole section up here in Romans is about. And it's called in mind, the heading is Faith Triumphs in Trouble. We have been justified, therefore we have peace, eternal peace, in our Lord Jesus Christ. There is now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. Romans 5 verse 2 reads, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. What a countercultural mindset that is to glory in hard times, to be happy when things go wrong. Because I don't know about you, but that's that's not usually the way that I react. When something is hard in my life, when something has gone very badly, it's my first reaction to honestly sink into a depression, to sink into this mindset of, oh, how could things get any worse? What can I do from here? And yet, The Bible tells us that we should glory in these hard times. Glory because just as with Paul, God's strength is made more apparent in our weakness. We are required to lean on him for hope, for help, to find depths of his love and presence that we would not even know if we didn't experience tribulations. And this tribulation produces, it says, perseverance or endurance. It gives us a good character, a good outlook on the world, and it gives us hope. What hope? Hope in that glorification. Hope knowing that one day when this life is over, we will spend eternity in heaven with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That every tear will be wiped away, that every wrong will be made right. And this hope is not just some trivial passing hope. It's not just a word that we write on notebooks or shirts or, you know, things to make us happy. This is a steadfast hope because it is based in the Holy Spirit. It is based in the promises of the Lord because it says, verse 5 of Romans 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit if you have believed in Jesus for salvation, dwells within you. We have a right standing with God because of Jesus. We have peace for eternity because of his sacrifice. And we have hope in life's trials because he lives. Jesus changes everything. See, let me catch you on a couple of comments before we go into the next section of Romans chapter 5. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I get comments on my accent sometimes, and I am so flattered on the positive ones because by and large throughout my life, I've usually gotten negative comments about it. So thank you so much. Just a random question, are Christians going to be judged for sins at the judgment seat of Christ? That is an excellent question. I wish I had this book in here with me right now. I don't think I do. I think it's actually in the other room. Um, I'm going to send you a picture of this after the live stream. Excellent book. Um, It's called The Judgment Seat of Christ, and it's all about what's going to happen 
um, surrounding that, different viewpoints on it, and what the Bible says. Short answer right now, without having all the verses in front of me, no. Christians are not going to be judged for sins. Um, Jesus has already borne all of that punishment for our sins on the cross. When we are saved, we are outfitted in his righteousness. We are imputed in that, made clean in the sight of the Lord forever. Now, that being said, that is not a license to sin. Grace should not encourage us to go out and do things that we know that we're not supposed to do. Um, grace should be an incentive to live a holy life, to say, thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done for me. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to show the world what it's like to have this peace that passes all understanding and this joy that is eternal and founded in you. But at the judgment seat of Christ, we see Christians coming to receive eternal rewards. This is that judgment um, by fire that we were mentioning just previously with Jaren's question, where we see what we've built on that faith foundation. Whether we have built right things, good works done for the Spirit, or whether we are just scraping by and there with nothing but empty hands, just saying, thank you, Lord, uh, I have nothing to present to you. So the judgment seat's more about eternal rewards, uh, but not about being judged for sins. What we see there more is the great white throne judgment. When we have the great white throne judgment, that is for unbelievers. And unbelievers will, of course, be condemned because their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So, excellent question. And are there angels recording the sins we've committed? Um, I don't remember reading that anywhere in Scripture. Um, I, 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 I don't think I've heard that before, but that's an excellent question. When we are saved, really, though we still sin, what happens then is a breach in fellowship. We have this opportunity post-justification, talking about sanctification here. We have this amazing opportunity to walk in a close relationship with the Lord, to live life as it was meant to be lived. This is the purpose for which man was created, to have a relationship with the Lord. And when we sin, we break that closeness. God cannot commune with darkness. He is completely light. There is no darkness in him at all. And then we come to places like 1 John 1, 9. What are we supposed to do when we sin? Well, we confess our sin unto the Lord. We repent of what we have done. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. Um, that is one thing that this chapter we're going to get to here in Romans 5 is that God has freed us from these chains of sin's oppression. And it is such a lie from Satan that we must put ourselves back under those. Um, do not chain yourself up where the Lord has set you free. That can be taken two ways. Don't go back to, you know, old sins. Don't follow the ways of the old man. But also don't feel as if his love for you is conditioned on your behavior. We should walk in righteousness. That is the um, healthy way of living as a Christian. But also, when we are saved, our salvation is conditioned on nothing less but faith in Christ. Um, all of our guilt, all of our sins have been paid. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, yes, is tied for my all-time famous favorite verse along with Romans 8, 18. I love 2 Corinthians 12, 9. That has been a huge comfort to me in life. Every single time that I have um, struggled, especially with my anxiety, with OCD, with depression, knowing that God's strength is made perfect in my weakness, I'll take trouble any day if it brings me closer to Him. Knowing God has control gives us hope and all things working together for His glory. Yes. Absolutely. Good word, Thomas. Thank you. 
That is a good question, Jaren, about being filled with the Holy Spirit and of speaking in tongues. I have personally never spoken in tongues myself, but I do believe that I am filled in the Holy Spirit. Um, the Bible tells us that when we have believed in Christ, we are given the Spirit, that He sells us into the day of redemption. I'll have to see if I can find an article to send to you that like helps with Bible verses more than I'm able to right now because I totally understand the point where you are coming from. I will say that Matthew 7, 21 through 23 also warns us that wolves in sheep clothing who claim to be Christians will be judged of their sins. Yes, people who on the outside look good, kind of like Jesus was talking about with um, the hypocritical religious leaders of Israel on the outside. They were like whitewashed tombs. They looked so good, but on the inside, they were full of nothing but death and decay and worthlessness, just dead faith. Absolutely. Some people look like they're living the right life, that they are Christians and they are not. That's why it's so important not to judge people um, because only God knows hearts. We look on the outside, but God looks on the inside. Excellent. You guys are asking such good questions. I'm really having to think about these and I love it because it makes me dig deeper. So thank you so much. Okay, Romans chapter five, going to verses six through 11. This is our next up to the last section. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This right here is true love. You will never find a more beautiful, succinct, perfect expression of love than on the cross. Again, we don't have any redeeming qualities as human beings. We don't deserve the love that God gave us. And yet, Romans 5 tells us that while we were still sinners, even though we have fallen from grace, God died for us. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. God loved us enough not only to die for us, but to live like us, to take on divinity, taking on the humility of flesh, the brokenness of the human condition, being tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. That's why Jesus is able to be a merciful and faithful high priest because he understands what it's like to suffer. And he still died for us. He still took our place on the cross. Verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What does that mean? We shall be saved from wrath through him. We have been justified by his blood. When we believe in the testimony of Jesus unto salvation, we are made clean before God. We will be saved from wrath. We will be saved, it is saying, from eternal condemnation in a place of literal torment called hell. When we are found in Christ, not by any righteousness of our own, but by his righteousness, we are saved from the flames of hell. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This right standing that we have was bought by Christ, the righteous for the unrighteous. We have been justified and we will be glorified. One day we will be apart from the presence of sin forever. And what a wonderful day that will be. Moving on to the very last section, verses 12 through 21. My um, header on this says, Death in Adam, life in Christ. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. 
Adam in the garden acted as the corporate head for humanity. Every single person who has ever lived, who is living, or who ever will live was represented in Adam in that choice that he made to rebel against God. And because of that choice, because of the choice to eat that fruit that he was told not to eat, this wall of separation was built between creator and creation. And that wall was not able to be taken down by man. The Bible tells us that all of our righteousnesses, all of our good works, anything that we do that we think is so wonderful and that could save us is never enough. It's like filthy rags in God's sight, dirty washcloths, stained paper towels, whatever you want to call it. That's what our good works look like to him. Only one person, only one way could this wall be surmounted, and that is by Jesus Christ. That is again why Emmanuel, God with us, came. The Lord loves us. He created human beings for communion, for fellowship with himself. And he said, I am going to reach out. I'm going to fix this problem that man has created. And in him, we have this invitation to a new life. And this is what gets to me. We are not here on earth wandering with no destination to go to. We are here for a purpose. There is a destination unto which we have all been called, and that is heaven. Our fare, our ticket price, it's already been paid by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, and yet so many people deny it. So many people refuse that free ticket, that salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is why the scriptures tell us that the way to heaven, the road to heaven is narrow, yet the road to condemnation, the road to hell is so wide. Sin can seem so beautiful on the outside, so enticing, so easy and available. But we know that even Satan was an angel of light. But the purpose of sin is not good. The purpose of sin is not to fulfill us. It never can fulfill us. The end of sin is death. Sin wants to draw each and every one of us into the grave, into hell itself. The only way that we can ever live life as it was supposed to be lived is to walk in the Lord Jesus Christ, to put on his robe of righteousness. There is a quote, one of my favorite quotes of all time, by Thomas Aquinas that says, You have made us for ourselves, talking about God. And restless are our hearts until they come to rest in you. That is so true. Our hearts are always searching, looking for something. We know that we have been made for so much more. C.S. Lewis says, and I can't remember the exact wording, but something to the effect of, if we find ourselves longing for, searching for something beyond this world, it's because we know we were made for something more. For something more. And sin is not that something more, my friends. Jesus is that something more. So in Adam, all of humanity has been condemned. But what do we see next? Hope. Verse 15 of Romans chapter 5. But the free gift, salvation, is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So just as every person represented in Adam as the corporate head of humanity has been from birth condemned to death, no matter their degree of deservedness of this, no matter your level of sin, even if the Bible says it's not as big, as great as Adam's, that death passed along to all men. In the same way, and even greater, the gift of Christ, the gift of grace, 
when you believe in the testimony of Jesus, when you believe in him by faith, that is given to you righteousness, pardon, without measure, without regard for our sin, without regard for how little we deserve it. We are all given this same abundant measure of grace. Although Adam, his sin resulted in condemnation, this second Adam, this better Adam, Christ, his free gift results in justification, salvation for all who believe. Verse 17, for if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Just as this sin of Adam is passed down to all men, so the gift of grace is open to all, to whosoever will come. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There are no stipulations on that. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. All you have to do is believe. God does not care where you came from. He doesn't care where you are. He doesn't care about anything in your background because grace is sufficient. He wants your whole heart. Verse 20 and 21, finishing this up this chapter. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law helps us see. It helped Israel realize and it helps us to understand, too, that we cannot do anything to save ourselves. Our sin is too great. Nothing can satisfy but the blood of Jesus Christ. He completed the law. When he said, it is finished on the cross, it was finished. Now, all you have to do is simply believe in him for salvation. There is hope in this life because of Christ. There is life to be lived because he lives. The resurrection changes absolutely everything. We have peace because of this gospel of peace. This peace is persistent. It's beyond human comprehension. And it's founded in the sacrifice of Christ. That's why he's called the Prince of Peace. He brings this assurance of new life. This reason to keep going, this second Adam who brings freedom, whereas the first one brought condemnation. Grace is greater, just like the hymn says, than all of our sins. Our freedom was paid for in full. It breaks my heart when I see people. And there are churches out there, unfortunately. There are cults out there that teach that you have to work for your salvation. That maybe Jesus just bought the opportunity for you to save yourself. But that is not at all what scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that Jesus didn't buy the opportunity for us to be made righteous and right in the sight of the Lord. Jesus bought our entire righteousness. Jesus bought the place in heaven for everyone who believes. This is not a halfway gift. This is a free gift, no strings attached, that pays for everything. I wish the entire world understood the grace of the Lord. This is why I do Christian Conversations. This is why it matters so much to me to do live streams and podcasts and videos is to reach anyone who may be suffering to reach anyone who may be under that burden of debt, really under that burden of the law, trying to save themselves, trying to make righteous and right what can never be made righteous and right unless it is under the Lord's saving grace. Emmanuel has come 
And in this new life that we live as believers in Christ, we are called to give everything. Jesus gave it all on the cross. And to quote another hymn, all to him we owe. Not our maybe or our sometimes or our I'll do it later, but our everything. The Christian walk, sanctification, is laying behind those things that were before and moving ahead in the Spirit, persisting knowing that heaven is our home and that we're just passing through earth. But while we're here, let's show the world what it's like to have this enduring peace. Not that every day in the Christian life will be easy, not that every day will be happy, but that every day has hope because Jesus lives. Life has a purpose. You were made for a purpose. God made you and he loves you. Your life means something. Don't ever let Satan tell you the opposite because it's simply not true. This, this hope we have persists beyond our wildest dreams. This relationship with God is what we have been called to. Divine, infinite has reached out to finite. He is calling your name and he is calling you home. All that's left to do is to answer. We have hope in our struggles. We can joy in our tribulations because God is always right there. You don't have to enter a church building to be in the presence of the Lord. You don't have to wait for Sunday. Pray to him now. Rejoice in him now. Read his word right now. Every day is an opportunity to love the Lord as you are being loved by him. And that's where we end Romans today. Romans chapter 5, an excellent chapter and an excellent book. Um, I could talk about Romans every day. Like I said, one of my favorite books in the Bible. So encouraging, especially Romans chapter 8. If you're having a hard day, I suggest that you pick up the word and read Romans chapter 8. It will really help calm your spirit and help you to focus on him. So I'm going to scroll through, make sure I haven't missed any questions or comments. I am so thankful for each one of you who has joined today. Um, it's been so nice seeing friends on here and talking with you. I just, it, it makes my heart happy. I love doing this. This is my community right here, you guys. To have friends on here, believers all across the world is just such a blessing to me. I love each and every one of you guys. If you just jumped on, thank you so much for joining as well. Yes, yes, his, his grace is sufficient. Amen to that. So if you are free tomorrow, um, I will be doing this live stream again on TikTok. Um, same topic. The wording, of course, may be a little bit different because I don't have any of this written down. So... Um, it may be slightly different, but it's going to be pretty much the same message. I would love to have you join me again. I would love to see you over there. Uh, this live stream will be up here on my page. So if you jumped in late or you had to leave early and you want to watch the rest of it, it will be up here in full. And if you have any questions, uh, any comments, any prayer requests, please do uh, reach out to me about that. I know there were a couple people on here that I was going to message resources, a book I really like, an article. So if there's anything, any suggestions or articles that you would like as well, please let me know. Um, I love digging deeper into the, wor to the word. I love books. So I'm happy to talk about Jesus anytime. Thanks for the word. God bless everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. So I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your weekend. I'm going to go ahead and jump off and I hope to hear from you guys soon. Bye.